Second part of chapter three of the first volume of the Life of Reason. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Fredrik Karlsson. The Life of Reason by George Santayana. Side note: Causes and essences contrasted. When reflection, turning to the comprehension of a chaotic experience, busies itself about recurrences when it seeks to normalize in some way things coming and going and to straighten out the causes of events that reflection is inevitably turned toward something dynamic and independent and can have no successful issue except in mechanical science when on the other hand reflection stops to challenge and question the fleeting object not so much to prepare for its possible return as to conceive its present nature this reflection is turned no less unmistakably in the direction of ideas and will terminate in logic or the morphology of being we attribute independence to things in order to normalize their recurrence we attribute essences to them in order to normalize their manifestations or constitution independence will ultimately turn to be an assumed constancy in material processes essence and assumed constancy in ideal meanings or points of reference in discourse the one marks the systematic distribution of objects the other their settled character side note veracity of intellect we talk of recurrent perceptions but materially considered no perception recurs each recurrence is one of a finite series and holds forever its place and number in that series yet human attention while it can survey several simultaneous impressions and find them similar cannot keep them distinct if they grow too numerous the mind has a native bias an inveterate preference for form and identification water does not run downhill more persistently than attention turns experience into constant terms the several repetitions of one essence given in consciousness will tend at once to be neglected and only the essence itself the character shared by those sundry perceptions will stand and become a term in mental discourse after a few strokes of the clock the reiterated impressions merge and cover one another we lose count and perceive the quality and rhythm but not the number of the sounds if this is true of so abstract and mathematical a perception as is counting how emphatically true must it be of continuous and infinitely varied perceptions flowing in from the whole spatial world glimpses of the environment follow one another in quick succession like a regiment of soldiers in uniform only now and then does the stream take a new turn catch a new ray of sunlight or arrest our attention at some break the senses in their natural play revert constantly to familiar objects gaining impressions which differ but slightly from one another these slight differences are submerged in apperception so that sensation comes to be not so much an addition of new items to consciousness as a reburnishing there of some embedded device its character and relations are only slightly modified at each fresh rejuvenation to catch the passing phenomenon in all its novelty and idiosyncrasy is a work of artifice and curiosity such an exercise does violence to intellectual instinct and involves an aesthetic power of diving bodily into the stream of sensation having thrown overboard all rational ballast and escaped at once the inertia and the momentum of practical life normally every datum of sense is at once devoured by a hungry intellect and digested for the sake of its vital juices the result is that what ordinarily remains in memory 
is no representative of particular moments or shocks, though sensation, as in dreams, may be incidentally recreated from within, but rather a logical possession, a sense of acquaintance with a certain field of reality, in a word, a consciousness of knowledge. Side note. Can the transcendent be known? But what, we may ask, is this reality which we boast to know? May not the skeptic justly contend that nothing is so unknown and indeed unknowable as this pretended object of knowledge? The sensations which reason treats so cavalierly were at least something actual while they lasted and made good their momentary claim to our interest. But what is this new ideal figment, unseizable yet ever-present, invisible but indispensable, unknowable, yet alone interesting or important? Strange that the only possible object or theme of our knowledge should be something we cannot know. Side note. Can the immediate be meant? An answer to these doubts will perhaps appear if we ask ourselves what sort of contact with reality would satisfy us, and in what terms we expect or desire to possess the subject matter of our thoughts. Is it simply corroboration that we look for? Is it a verification of truth in sense? It would be unreasonable in that case, after all the evidence we demand has been gathered, to complain that the ideal term thus concurrently suggested, the supersensible substance, reality, or independent object, does not itself descend into the arena of immediate sensuous presentation. Knowledge is not eating, and we cannot expect to devour and possess what we mean. Knowledge is recognition of something absent. It is a salutation, not an embrace. It is an advance on sensation precisely because it is representative. The terms or goals of thought have for their functions to subtend long tracts of sensuous experience to be ideal links between fact and fact invisible wires behind the scenes, threads along which inference may run in making phenomena intelligible and controllable. An idea that should become an image would cease to be ideal, a principle that is to remain a principle can never become a fact. A god that you could see with the eyes of the body, a heaven you might climb into by a ladder planted at Bethel, would be parts of this created and interpretable world, not terms in its interpretation, nor objects in a spiritual sphere. Now external objects are thought to be principles and sources of experience. They are accordingly conceived realities on an ideal plane. We may look for all the evidence we choose before we declare our inference to be warranted, but we must not ask for something more than evidence, nor expect to know realities without inferring them anew. They are revealed only to understanding. We cannot cease to think and still continue to know. Side note. Is thought a bridge from sensation to sensation? It may be said, however, that principles and external objects are interesting only because they symbolize further sensations. That thought is an expedient of finite minds, and that representation is a ghostly process which we crave to materialize into bodily possession. We may grow sick of inferring truth and long rather to become reality. Intelligence is after all no compulsory possession, and while some of us would gladly have more of it, others find that they already have too much. The tension of thought distresses them, and to represent what they cannot and would not be is not a natural function of their spirit. To such minds, experience that should merely corroborate ideas would prolong dissatisfaction. 
the ideas must be realized they must pass into immediacy if reality a word employed generally in a eulogistic sense is to mean this desired immediacy no ideal of thought can be real all intelligible objects and the whole universe of mental discourse would then be an unreal and conventional structure impinging ultimately on sense from which it would derive its sole validity there would be no need of quarrelling with such a philosophy were not its use of words rather misleading call experience in its existential and immediate aspect if you will the sole reality that will not prevent reality from having an ideal dimension the intellectual world will continue to give beauty meaning and scope to those bubbles of consciousness on which it is painted reality would not be in that case what thought aspires to reach consciousness is the least ideal of things when reason is taken out of it reality would then need thought to give it all those human values of which in its substance it would have been wholly deprived and the ideal would still be what lent music to throbs and significance to being Side note. mens naturaliter platonica the equivocation favored by such language at once begins to appear is not thought with all its products a part of experience must not sense if it be the only reality be sentient sometimes of the ideal what the sight is to a city that is immediate experience to the universe of discourse the latter is all held materially within the limits defined by the former but if immediate experience be the seat of the moral world the moral world is the only interesting possession of immediate experience when a waste is built on however it is a violent paradox to call it still a waste and an immediate experience that represents the rest of sentience with all manner of ideal harmonies read into the whole in the act of representing it is an immediate experience raised to its highest power it is the life of reason in vain then will a philosophy of intellectual abstention limit so platonic a term as reality to the immediate aspect of existence when it is the ideal aspect that endows existence with character and value together with representative scope and a certain lien upon reality more legitimate therefore would be the assertion that knowledge reaches reality when it touches its ideal goal reality is known when as in mathematics a stable and unequivocal object is developed by thinking the locus or material embodiment of such a reality is no longer in view these questions seem to the logician irrelevant if necessary ideas find no illustration in sense he deems the fact an argument against the importance and validity on sensation not in the least a disproof of his ideal knowledge if no site be found on earth for the platonic city its constitution is none the less recorded and enshrined in heaven nor is that the only true ideal that has not where to lay its head what in the sensualistic and mystical system was called reality will now be termed appearance and what there figured as an imaginary construction borne by the conscious moment will now appear to be a prototype for all existence and an internal standard for its estimation it is this rationalistic or platonic system little as most men may suspect the fact that finds a first expression in ordinary perception when you distinguish your sensations from their cause and laugh at the idealist 
as this kind of sceptic is called, who says that chairs and tables exist only in your mind, you are treating a figment of reason as a deeper and truer thing than the moments of life whose blind experience that reason has come to illumine. What you call the evidence of sense is pure confidence in reason. You will not be so idiotic as to make no inferences from your sensations. You will not pin your faith so unimaginatively on momentary appearance as to deny that the world exists when you stop thinking about it. You feel that your intellect has wider scope and has discovered many a thing that goes on behind the scenes, many a secret that would escape a stupid and gaping observation. It is the fool that looks to look and stops at the barely visible. You not only look but see, for you understand. Side note. Identity and independence predicated of things. Now the practical burden of such understanding, if you take the trouble to analyze it, will turn out to be what the skeptic says it is, assurance of eventual sensations. But as these sensations in memory and expectations are numerous and indefinitely variable, you are not able to hold them clearly before the mind. Indeed, the realization of all the potentialities which you vaguely feel to lie in the future is a task absolutely beyond imagination. Yet your present impressions, dependent as they are on your chance attitude, and dispositions, and on a thousand trivial accidents, are far from representing adequately all that might be discovered or that is actually known about the object before you. This object, then, to your apprehension, is not identical with any of the sensations that reveal it, nor is it exhausted by all these sensations when they are added together, yet it contains nothing assignable but what they might conceivably reveal. As it lies in your fancy, then, this object, the reality, is a complex and elusive entity, the sum at once and the residuum of all particular impressions which, underlying the present one, have bequeathed to it their surviving linkage in discourse and consequently endowed it with a large part of its present character. With this hybrid object, sensuous in its materials and ideal in its locus, each particular glimpse is compared and is recognized to be but a glimpse, an aspect which the object presents to a particular observer. Here are two identifications. In the first place, various sensations and felt relations which cannot be kept distinct in the mind fall together into one term of discourse, represented by a sign, a word, or a more or less complete sensuous image. In the second place, the new perception is referred to that ideal entity of which it is now called a manifestation and effect. Such are the primary relations of reality and appearance. A reality is a term of discourse based on a psychic complex of memories, associations, and expectations, but constituted in its ideal independence by the assertive energy of thought. An appearance is a passing sensation, recognized as belonging to that group of which the object itself is the ideal representative, and accordingly regarded as a manifestation of that object. Thus the notion of an independent and permanent world is an ideal term used to mark and as it were to justify the cohesion in space and the recurrence in time of recognizable groups of sensations. This coherence and recurrence force the intellect, if it would master experience at all or understand anything, to frame the idea of such a reality. If we wish to defend the use of such an idea, 
and prove to ourselves its necessity all we need do is to point to that coherence and recurrence in external phenomena that brave effort and flight of intelligence which in the beginning raised man to the conception of reality enabling him to discount and interpret appearance will if we retain our trust in reason raise us continually anew to that same idea by a no less spontaneous and victorious movement of thought end of chapter three